Well, happy 4th of July, everybody. What a wonderful opportunity to celebrate family as we begin to expand our social bubbles a little and enjoy extended family and maybe even some friends over this weekend. I also hope that you will take some time this weekend to reflect on some of the good things that God is doing in the midst of this crazy 2020 year. By the way, it's July. We're halfway through it, believe it or not. Well, the last five weeks, we've been looking at the beginning of creation, the beginning of the church, and the beginning of Waterline, and how it informs how we move forward as a church family in this new beginning and search for our next lead pastor. The last two weeks, we've looked at the beginning of the church in John chapter 20 and learned a little bit about how God has used seasons of sheltering in place within many leaders' lives to prepare them for the incredible things that he had in their future. Last week, we took a look at the Holy Spirit. We talked about how he is often neglected and misunderstood part of the Trinity and that we can approach our relationship with him as we would any other because the Bible portrays him as a person. If you missed either of the last two messages, I encourage you to take some time and go back on Facebook or YouTube channel or our website and check them out. I'm trying to keep them in 15 minutes so it won't take you too long. This week, we're looking at the early church in Acts chapter 2, and I'm so excited for us to look together at how God is bringing the church of today full circle towards how he structured the early church. Now, we don't have time to read all of Acts chapter 2, but I do want to highlight a few sections. Let's start right at the beginning of chapter 2, verse 1. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running, and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. Wow, what an amazing experience it must have been to be part of the first visitation of the Holy Spirit after Jesus ascended to heaven. To experience him move in power like that in big ways. This is another example of God showing up in big ways while his leaders were sheltering in place. They were all gathered together in one place and then suddenly, oh, how I dream for suddenly moments for you and for me, where the Holy Spirit shows up like that in my life, in my work, in my life group. Has the Holy Spirit ever suddenly showed up in a worship experience or maybe during your prayer time and it changed everything? I've had several experiences like that over the years where the Holy Spirit seemed to suddenly show up in a powerful way and everyone present was immediately aware of him and oh, how I long for that for each of us and for us as a church. So the Holy Spirit has come into the upper room where the disciples were meeting with a loud sound that caught the attention of people even outside the building that they were meeting in. Then the disciples each started speaking in languages they've never learned and didn't know. Remember, the primary purpose of the Holy Spirit is to empower us to give witness to Jesus or to tell other people about the gospel. Let's look back in Acts chapter 2, verse 7. They, the people, were completely amazed. How can this be, they exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages about the wonderful things God has done. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean? So now the disciples have moved outside of their hiding place where they've been sheltering out of fear. And they're stepping out boldly and telling those around about all the wonderful things that God's done through Jesus. Then Peter stands up and preaches an amazing sermon on the street. Let's jump in Acts chapter 2, verse 14 through 41. It's an amazing sermon, and I wish we had time to read it all but together, but we don't. So we're going to let me pull a few verses out, if you will. Then... 
Peter stepped forward with the eleven other apostles and shouted to the crowd, Listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. Make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. No, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. Now in verse 32, God raised Jesus from the dead, he said, and we are all witnesses of this. Now he is exalted to the place of highest honor in heaven at God's right hand and the Father, as he had promised, gave him the Holy Spirit to pour out upon us just as you see here today. So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified to be both Lord and Messiah. So the Holy Spirit falls, the disciples fill the streets speaking in languages they don't know before and Peter gets up and preaches the gospel in the streets for the first time. That's quite a day. But God's not even finished yet. Verse 37 says, Peter's words pierced their hearts and said to them and to the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you, to your children, and to those far away, all who have been called by the Lord our God. Then Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging all his listeners, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. So one day, day one of the church, they see 3,000 people saved and baptized. Now that's an amazing way to launch a church. Day one, the church was a mega church. You see, big churches are not bad. I pray every church in this town becomes a mega church. It takes all kinds of churches to reach all kinds of people. There are some things that can only happen when there's a multitude of people gathered under Christ. So let's keep praying God continues to draw people to Waterline and that, that we continue to grow to the glory of God. So how did the disciples deal with this great influx of people? How did the disciples structure this new group of believers? Verse 42, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders, and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold all their belongings and gave what they had to anyone in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity all while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. They met in the temple and they gathered in homes. They gathered in groups, large groups in temples and then homes around tables. As I think about it, churches, especially in pre-COVID-19, they're Sunday centric. Everything revolves around the temple or Sunday. I believe this has hurt all of us. It's encouraged us to just focus on our spiritual lives and spiritual community one day a week. I believe God is calling us globally through this pandemic back to the table. You see a rhythm of the walk of the early church was table and then temple and then table and then temple. We've been hopping on one leg and wondering why we can't run as a church. I believe it's because we haven't fully embraced the power of meeting in our homes and smaller groups of believers. This is why I was so excited a few weeks ago talking about how the Holy Spirit has been leading thousands of churches to launch home church movements within their congregation without any national conference or denominational directive. If you missed it, I mentioned just a few weeks ago that the same week we launched our home experiences, without talking to anybody, thousands of other churches around North America started the exact same thing. Different names and nuances, but all in all, God was calling the church to a natural rhythm of temple and table, and we're a part of that. 
This is why I'm committed to our home experiences and why you're going to get tired of me encouraging you to sign up for one, to be in one, to join one, to get involved in our home experiences and life groups. Over the next six months, I believe this is how you and I are going to grow stronger in the Lord, more emotionally, spiritually healthy, and to grow stronger as a church. I cannot, as your pastor, encourage you to walk the Christian life from Sunday experience to Sunday experience to Sunday experience. It's just hopping on one leg. We must learn to walk in rhythm of temple and table, temple and table, or home experience to Sunday experience to home experience to Sunday experience. So Waterline today, I want to leave you with one question. Do you have a temple table rhythm in your life? If not, will you consider reaching out to us at the office so that we can help find you the best place to get started at the table? In our next steps, you're gonna be given some dates when we have some home experiences happening. You can also go to waterlinechurch.com slash home for more information about times and places. But we would love for you to experience life in a life group or in a home experience. And if you would consider that, would you text the word me to 317-820-2757? If you're considering stepping out and wanting more information about being part of a life group, but maybe you'd like to host a life group. And if that's the case, then you can text the word home to the same number, 317-820-2757. If you'd like to host or invite us into your home to, for us to help create an experience there. Well, Waterline, I'm so excited about how God is moving and how we're being part of what he's doing around the world by leading us into this temple and table rhythm. It means that he wants to help you and I to grow in strength through these experiences in the coming months. I love you. I love you. I love you. Happy 4th, everyone.